Please turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6 and the breaking of the seven seals. Let's read verses 1 to 2. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider with a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering, end to conquer. Did you survive? Great. <laughs> first time, folks, first time. <laughs> first time. <laughs> Here we have in that passage John's first rendering of the introduction of Antichrist to earth. He's the first character to emerge from the seals. The first horseman of what is commonly referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Great movie. In general terms, it's a picture of a winner, a victor. Hence, the crown of victory. It's not a crown of a king. It's the crown of victory, as if he's just won a race. Here John shows him at his most benign. At the beginning of his public life. And we are not yet attuned to his motives and goal. Victory over what? Conqueror of who? Who or what will he be shooting at with his bow? As I pointed out in session 11, generally speaking, for the first half of the tribulation, Antichrist is coming onto the world stage. He is clever. He is winsome. He is a strong leader who has all the answers to the world's problems. People are drawn to him like flies to honey, or should we say like a dog to its vomit. He will eventually be recognized as the Savior of the world. This describes him during the roughly first half of the tribulation. He is working, he is plotting, he is setting in place those who will assist him in his plan. But his true purpose remains secret, shielded from the rest of the world. Now turn, please, to our passage in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, a dramatic chapter. Fascinating. And let's read the first two verses there. Revelation 13, verses 1 to 2. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Here is John's rendering of Antichrist later in his career. Approximately three and one half years after his emergence in Revelation 6. Now is when we, not necessarily those on earth at the time, but we, see him in full flower, revealing the true evil and ugliness lying beneath his heretofore benign public image. And from those first two verses, it is immediately apparent, the beast from the sea is not a nice guy. There is one more contrast between the two renderings. In the first, we see more the person on the white horse, while in the second we see more the political structure undergirding him and over which he rules supreme. 
Additionally, in the second, we see clearly from whence His power comes and whose servant He truly is. Could we have chart 15, please, Adam? Not yet. So we're ready for verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Now frankly, I'm a little disappointed in the NASB 95. The updated NASB. It doesn't happen very often, but it happened with this verse. Because they inserted, along with the NIVs, which do this all the time, the NASB rarely does it, Along with the NIVs and the CSB, they inserted the word dragon. It's not that it's inaccurate. It's just not there. The word in the original text is he. As it is in the original NASB. How about your NASB, Greg? Does it have dragon or he? Dragon. If you had the various versions spread before you, you would see that the translators do not agree on where that first sentence belongs. They put it all in different places. Some place it at the beginning of verse 1, as the NASB, NIVs, and King James versions. The CSB, oddly, makes it an 18th verse of chapter 12. They add a verse, number 18. The ESV, which in my opinion is the best for this verse, for this passage, tacks it onto the end of verse 17 of chapter 12. That's really the best place for it. At least the other ones, most of the other ones, at least put it in the right order. They just put it in the next chapter. The King James versions working from other manuscripts have then I stood on the sand of the sea, which implies I, John. The difference between I and he in the Greek is just one letter. Estathon and estathe. Take off the N and it means one thing. To add the N and it means something else. The older and preferred manuscripts have he, referring to the dragon. In my opinion, opinion, the ESV treats this the best. The dragon stood on the seashore. By placing the sentence at the end of 12, verse 17, which is explicitly all about the dragon, so the pronoun he clearly points to the dragon. We don't have to wonder. I think that's the most logical place for this sentence to dwell. Remember, there are no chapter or verse breaks in the original text. These were added much later by editors. And God bless them. Can you imagine trying to find something without the chapter and verse breaks? Oi! It's hard enough as it is. Nor are there paragraph and sentence breaks. The original Greek is just one long string of characters. So we're grateful that they've broken it up. It's just once in a while they get it wrong. Now, when one looks at verses 1 to 2 as a unit, the he or dragon makes perfect sense. It is the dragon causing the beast to rise out of the sea. He is standing there conducting the whole scene. He, the beast rises from the sea at his beck and call. And it is the dragon who gives him his power and his throne and great authority. It's a, a very cinematic moment. Moment. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It, it's easy to see this as a moment of birth, as in Botticelli's The Birth of Venus rising from the sea, fully grown upon a giant scallop shell. But this does not depict the beast's birth, nor even his introduction to the public, but him at his zenith of power. The context following chapter 12, is not just logical, but profound. Satan, the beast's father, as it were, and mentor, has just been cast out of heaven 
angry, frustrated, and as it were a dragon breathing fire, Satan turns to his disciple, his son, as it were, and elevates him into his intended global role. The dragon is the one orchestrating all of this. Of course, with God's permission. Now let me throw in a sidebar here. No extra charge. The precise sequence of this portion of the eschaton so bizarrely portrayed is a debatable point. We can't really say for sure. Do the events of chapter 13, which record the vision of the presentation of the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, that is, Antichrist and the false prophet, respectively, Do they follow after Satan has been frustrated by his impotent pursuit of Israel subsequent to his fall? Do they perhaps represent a a step Satan took between his second and third attacks against Israel? If you recall from our last session, three, three attacks against Israel taken by Satan after he was kicked out of heaven. So the second and between the second and third attacks would fall chapter, uh, verses 15 to 17 of chapter 12, when he turns away from direct pursuit of the protected Jews to aim his venom at others. Maybe that's when he presents Antichrist in full power. Or do they represent part of Satan gathering his forces, joining human to angelic troops in preparation for even the first attack? Verses 13 to 14 of chapter 12. Bottom line is we really can't say for sure. All of this is happening somewhere around the middle of the tribulation when things really go south. Regarding the fact that the beast rises from out of the sea, coupled with, for example, the statement in chapter 21, verse 1, that in the new earth there's no longer any sea. I've included a separate handout. Now, now that you've... I waited till Scott sat down and then I... Okay, now. As always, this is not for today. This is background. This is background for you to chew on at your leisure. The first side of it deals with the sea in God's Word. Sea. S-E-A. The primary reason for including this is based on what Kenneth William Lovett wrote about this. But I've added to that a preface to his writing by John MacArthur, who takes a little different approach to it. Now, on the back side... I've included a discussion by Gleason Archer comparing Daniel 7 to Daniel 8 uh, because we see two different beasts. Uh, I'm sorry, scratch that. Be kind, rewind. Um, Two different horns, two different little horns in One in Daniel 7, one in Daniel 8, and it can be a little confusing. So there's a very good discussion by Gleason Archer here about that. So that's that's for later when you feel like it. This, This dissertation, this is from a dissertation by Kenneth William Lovett, for his Ph.D., in which he presents his thesis that the Old Testament uses the sea as a negative motif and that God treats the sea as an enemy. The sea is opposed to God's purposes in the biblical narrative and finds itself on the receiving end of God's rebuke and restraint. End quote. That's Kenneth William Lovett. I will reserve further discussion of this in class for when we're in chapter 21. Probably in 2024. 
Now, the beast is described having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. The first and best source to illuminate our understanding of this description of Antichrist is found in the prophecy of Daniel. Please turn to Daniel chapter 7. It's easy to think of the figure called Antichrist as the instigator of everything around him. That is, that that he is the one who will create and organize all of his power structure. If you just read it in, in the Revelation, you might think that's the case. But it's not. Even before the beast comes onto the scene, there will be a central, extremely powerful political entity dominating the world. And most scholars refer to this as a revived Roman Empire. Get that, it might be the phone. We're told in verse 1 of Daniel 7, that he was in bed when he saw a dream and visions in his mind. So we're talking about a vision here. In this, he first sees, quote, the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. So in that alone is great imagery. Heaven, <clears throat> heaven is stirring up the sea, which is symbolic of the polluted turbulent Gentile humanity. Society. Similar to Revelation 13, where two evil figures emerge from first the sea and second from the earth. Here, four great beasts representing four kingdoms or empires emerge from the mass of humanity. We're told that the first beast was like a lion with the wings of an eagle. The second resembled a bear. The third was like a leopard with four wings and four heads. These first three beasts represent, respectively, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek or Alexandrian Empire. So let's read Daniel 7. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little horn, came up among them, And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. Who says the Bible isn't interesting? Here is a beast far more powerful than the first three. And the description of its teeth being of iron is a strong clue to the empire the beast represents. Rome, the colossus of the latter part of the Iron Age. This new Roman Empire will overwhelm, either destroying or apprehending all that is left over from the three previous empires. So these beasts represent this empire, and then after that, this one, then this one, and then finally the fourth. And its ten horns in the vision represent the confederation of ten states of which it is comprised. Thus, we might picture these horns not as a separate... I've seen some illustrations that are, if this is bizarre, really bizarre. 
Don't try to paint this. I don't care how good an artist you are. When you, when you look, get into the eschaton, don't even try. It just looks stupid. Uh, they, they take uh, like a rhinoceros's horn, a rhino's horn, and they'll have ten of them or seven of them, you know. And, it, and one has a little mouth talking. It, uh, it, probably it's better to think of this more like antlers. Five on each side. It's the season. <laughs> Those poor bucks. They chase and chase and the girls just run. Where was I? <laughs> yeah, in season. As Daniel watches, a new horn emerges. I am totally befuddled by the commentators who say this is one of the ten. It's not. It's a new horn. Multiple passages make it clear. A new horn emerges from within the ten others. The text reads, another horn. Not one of the ten. It's another one, which I take to mean not one of the first ten. Oh yeah, I explained that. Go away. Though small at first, it soon destroys three adjacent horns. So he's a lively little horn, and he takes out the three that are nearest. He's tough. It's implied, and it would also be how these power structure struggles often worked historically, that the remaining horns then become vassals of this new little horn. The, the, the new one takes over the, the, the nearest kings around him, and the rest of them say, okay, here you go. We'll, be, we'll, we'll do what you want us to do. You win. It's always how it plays out in history. Finally, since we're told that this new horn has eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts, the horn represents a specific ruler, not, not a kingdom, not a nation state. Some say, well, that this represents a nation. Well, no, it's, it's personified. It's a person. It's the one in charge of that nation state. In verses 21 to 22, Daniel appends more of what we saw this little horn doing, of what he saw the horn doing. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. In his vision, Daniel asks someone standing nearby to explain this alarming, distressing vision. Look at, let's begin with verse 23. Thus he said, So here's the explanation. If you're wondering, okay, what does all this mean? Well, we're going to find out. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them. So it's different. It's not one of the ten. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. And he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. This guy will be strong. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, And half a time, three and a half years, the latter half of the tribulation. But the court will sit for judgment, here's the good news, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. If you've been wondering how some previously unknown figure could in just a few short years become so powerful as to literally rule the world. These texts explain that much of the structure of his empire was already in place. 
Antichrist will indeed be different from the previous ones, but the worldwide power structure will have already been, in, been set in place by the fourth beast. The revived Roman Empire. Which will, quote, devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Now back to Revelation 13, please. Based on the lessons of history, one might conclude that this ten-nation confederacy ruling the world will be in existence prior to the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. Now, I, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but if you lean back in your chair and think about it, it challenges the imagination that in just a few short years all this, wor- all this would come about after the inception of the tribulation. So, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that a revived Roman Empire just, boom, tribulation, oh, here we are, and then he takes it over three and a half years later. I think it's been a long time coming, long time forming. There may be dramatic moves during the tribulation, like, Antichrist taking over. But I think the roots of this, the, the genesis of it, predates tribulation. It just seems to make sense to me the way these things normally work. If I'm correct, this could further explain the timing of the rapture. Christ returns to remove His church not just before the evils of the tribulation, thank you God, but to save it from any further pain from being under the thumb of an evil empire. Maybe even believers will get a a taste of the tribulation from this empire taking over the world. The picture in John's vision is of the beast in full power, hence the middle of the tribulation. Opinions vary slightly, but we can take the ten horns, each with its own diadem, as representing the ten kingdoms of the original confederation, three of which were destroyed or consumed by the beast. Some say the seven heads represent the remaining kings that receive their power from the beast. Even I can do that math, three from ten is seven. But probably a better interpretation is that the seven heads represent successive world empires leading up to Antichrist. This harmonizes with an even more opaque prophecy in chapter 17. Let's look at that. Revelation 17. We have not plumbed the depths of bizarre yet. Revelation 17, let's begin reading at verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of which have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received total power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. They are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. We'll hold a a prayer meeting when it's time for me to figure that out. (laughs) Yeah. Please, God, save me from chapter 17. But it, one thing is covered there. You, did, you, did you get it? Seven kings, five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. In other words, these precede Antichrist. In Scripture, to be a son is to be like to behave like, to share the same qualities of, perhaps even look like one's father. John 14, 9. J. 
Jesus could say to Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. You don't need any more. You got it all right here. As with Jesus and Father God, so with Antichrist and his father, Satan. The red dragon, Satan, is described with almost an identical appearance as the beast in 12.3. Now this is describing the uh, dragon. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems, like father, like son. As the frosting on this perverse cake, the vision includes that, quote, on his heads were blasphemous names, slanderous, abusive, profane names. Verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. This This is a fascinating vision of Antichrist, the beast, for he's described here as if he has incorporated into himself the traits of the first three beasts, which the fourth beast replaced, mentioned in Daniel 7. As we saw earlier, the first three beasts represented respectively Babylon, the lion, the Medo-Persian Empire, the bear, and the Greek or Alexandrian Empire, the leopard. And now what John sees in front of him is the beast, Antichrist, looking, he's got parts like all those other three. In other words, he he ingested them. He took, took them over. These world empires are now a part of the one who truly rules the world. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. John's vision makes crystal clear who is behind Antichrist. And again we have the profane mirror image of the relationship between Jesus and Father God. Jesus was God in flesh, yet at the same time subservient to the Father, obedient to Him, revealing His nature to man. Matthew 11, 25 to 27, John 4, 34, John 8, 29, and Hebrews 10, 5 to 9. The beast is essentially Satan in flesh. Most commentators believe that Satan, Satan possesses him, goes into him, the way he came into uh, Judas. So he's a human being possessed by Satan. Satan in flesh, it is from him, the dragon, that he acquires all his power and authority. Now we can read this sentence one of a couple of ways. They both essentially mean the same thing, but it's two little twists on it. We can read it, the dragon gave the beast the dragon's power, the dragon's throne and great authority. Or, And the dragon gave the beast the power that the beast has, and the beast's throne and authority. Either way, the power behind the throne is Satan. Now let's read our next two verses. Revelation 13, verses 3 to 4. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? No applause necessary. (laughs) Don't worry. Just kidding. I never say that. That's my problem. Here's Satan's trump card. Antichrist will already be well known and popular after the first half of the tribulation. During a time in which thousands upon thousands are dying. Millions are dying. 
He will be or will appear to be. The jury is out. Mortally wounded. This could just be a trick done by the false prophet. Just, just PR. Or it could really be a miracle. Satan is supernatural. And Antichrist will come back to life. Whether real or an act perpetrated by the false prophet, the result will be the same. Worldwide amazement and adulation of the beast. Parenthetically, aren't you glad we won't be here for this? The world, I mean, we read that and say, yeah, okay, next verse. The world will be worshiping Satan. and His disciple. What a horrible time it will be. As always, opinions vary. Here I favor MacArthur over Walverd. Usually it's the other way around. Who interprets this slain head. Walverd interprets this slain head as referencing not the individual Antichrist, but the kingdom over which he reigns. That is, Walver believes that that which has been slain but comes back to life speaks of the Roman Empire. I don't agree with that. MacArthur offers far more convincing arguments for this referring to the individual. First, here it says that one of the heads was slain, but later in this chapter, John specifies the beast himself. Verse 12, the, he, the beast from the earth that's the false prophet, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Verse 14, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Both of these seem to make clear that we are talking about a person, an individual, not a state. Second, even in verse 3, it uses the personal pronoun, saying that his fatal wound was healed. And finally, does it track that a revival of the Roman Empire would excite such amazement, astonishment, and adoration. If I was told the Roman Empire had just been restored, I'd run for the hills. But this includes a worship statue in the Jerusalem temple, a statue of the beast. So I think a revival of the empire would excite rather dread and fear. Verse 4. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? In other words, he's all powerful. Can't be beaten. What a horrible time this will be on earth. We might say a beastly time on earth. It's true that the pattern of history has been that societal culture rises and falls in a regular, fairly regular pattern. Periods of licentious behavior and standards will be followed by a period of relative modesty and decorum. So the roaring, the roaring 20s, which were all about good times, was followed by the 30s and the 40s. And the 50s. A period of war will be followed by a period of peace. A time of conservative morality will be followed by a time of liberal immorality. So it's, it's a cycle. Sometimes, look at women's clothes. Cycles. 
Some say the world is getting better and better, but they're either blind or they lie. This world has been toying with evil for millennia. At times it's more prevalent, at others less so, but the overall inertia is toward darkness, depravity, evil. The picture before us in verse 4 is the portrait of a world that has abandoned all contact with righteousness, goodness, and light. To put it in Star Wars terminology, we will have irretrievably gone over to the dark side. In the past, this period would be followed by a reflexive return to the opposite, but no more. It will be so bad that only the bodily return of the Son of God will turn it around. Absent that, there will be no change for the better. By now, the society remaining on earth will be so far gone, it will be unrecoverable, beyond hope. The Apostle Paul describes this moment in his second letter, to the Thessalonians. Turn please to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning with verse 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of His coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. You get that. He's done this before. He's doing it here. If you, if you reject God, okay, He lets you go in that. He, he gives you over to that. Go, run with it. You've decided that, go with it. And in fact, I'm even going to change your mind so that you're easily fooled and you believe a lie. And that's what He's doing. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. In other words, all bets are off. No second chance at this point in time. If you reject Him, you've rejected Him. That's what you'll get. Earlier in this letter, just before this passage, Paul, back in Revelation 13, no, I'm sorry, still in Thessalonians, he gives one reason why the world finds itself in this state. In speaking of the coming of the day of the Lord to summon the Thessalonica church who mistakenly thought it had already come, they, they thought, oh, we're already in the end times. Paul says, no, no. He says, let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now we're in the end time. Before Christ will return, Antichrist must take his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And that's about as bad as you get. This is what is about to happen in the narrative. Now note, (laughs) don't miss Satan's focus on Israel is apparent in the location of Antichrist's seat of power. Satan hates Israel. How do we know this? He isn't setting up his throne in New York. Not Paris or London, but Jerusalem. And specifically, it's temple to Yahweh. 
There against the Jews is the focus of Satan's animus and rage. When it has never occurred before, what explains the depth of this depravity and Satan worship? The passage continues in 2 Thessalonians. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-6. In the rapture, we've covered this before, way in the beginning, if you remember. The restraining influence of the Holy Spirit and the church will be suddenly removed from the earth leaving in their wake a void that will be immediately filled by Satan and his demons, as well as his earthbound servants, Antichrist and the false prophet. Will this worship of Satan be truly worldwide? There will surely be some followers of Christ scattered around the globe. Certainly the two witnesses remember them, who will be witnessing for Christ to the very end, to the end of the tribulation, described in chapter 11. The 144,000 remnant of Messianic Israel protected for the duration. They'll be, still be there. And the group of Messianic Jews that has recently fled into the wilderness to the place of sanctuary prepared for them by God. So yes, there will be some righteousness. still left on the earth in scattered patches here and there. But the predominant culture and the only authorized religion for everyone but these righteous groups will be the worship of Satan and Antichrist. Antichrist will be a brutal dictator. No one will question him. No one will be able to question him. There is no house, no senate, no Knesset in Israel to vote him down. He is it. Period. One figure only with Satan behind him running the show. Now in conclusion, I've often mentioned that Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet constitute an evil parody of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Verse 4 concludes with another dark parallel. Crowds of worshipers crying out with great enthusiasm. Who is like the beast? They're enraptured. Who is able to wage war with him? He's all powerful. He's our guy. I'm reminded of another day in Jerusalem when instead of war, the worshipers were crying out peace. Luke 19, beginning with verse 36. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But now it will be a different song being sung. A different shout heard. These will be dark days indeed. Father God, if it's possible, (laughs) we pray for those who will still be on earth during this time. How dark, how horrible. But we thank You that we will not suffer through it. We will be with You above it all, literally. We will be sitting down to the feast. We will be enjoying Your company in whatever form we are. We will be praising You and worshiping You, not the Satan, not the Antichrist, but You the one God. And we worship You now. And we praise and thank You now for Your wisdom and Your rule. Amen.